Good morning, North America. Good afternoon, Europe, and good evening to everyone watching us from India. This is U.S. Election Watch. I'm Alistair D'Souza in Washington, D.C. These are the headlines. A judge unveils new evidence in Trump's election subversion case. Prosecutors say Trump resorted to crimes to overturn the 2020 election result. Melania Trump defends abortion rights in her new book. Melania shifts away for Trump's stance on abortion ahead of Election Day. Trump says he will revoke protected status for people from Haiti living legally in the U.S. Trump threatens to deport Haitian immigrants if elected. Dick Cheney to campaign with Harris in Wisconsin as Trump heads to battleground state, Michigan. New details of Donald Trump's alleged attempts to overturn the 2020 election have been revealed. It comes in newly unsealed court filings. Now, the document contains previously unknown accounts from Trump's closest aides. It reveals the most comprehensive picture yet of what Trump allegedly tried to do in that landmark case. Now, prosecutors allege that the former president intentionally lied to the public. A furious Trump took to social media saying, I did nothing wrong. They did. Parmeshwar Baba brings us this report. Donald Trump resorted to crimes in a failed bid to cling to power after losing the 2020 election, U.S. federal prosecutors have declared. In a newly unsealed 165-page court filing that argues that the former U.S. president is not entitled to immunity from prosecution. The filing was submitted by special counsel Jack Smith's team in response to a recent Supreme Court decision on presidential immunity. Mr. Smith filed the motion seeking a determination Trump was acting as a private citizen and not as the president when he sought to overturn the 2020 election. The new filing cites previously unknown accounts offered by Trump's closest aides to paint a portrait of an increasingly desperate president who, while losing his grip on the White House, used deceit to target every stage of the electoral process. This filing is probably the last opportunity for prosecutors to detail their case against Trump before the 5th November election, given there will not be a trial before Trump faces the Democratic Vice President Kamala Harris. Trump has pleaded not guilty to four criminal charges accusing him of a conspiracy to obstruct the congressional certification of the election, defraud the U.S. out of accurate results, and interfere with Americans' voting rights. Trump's lawyers have opposed allowing Smith to issue a sweeping court filing laying out their evidence, arguing it would be inappropriate to do so weeks before the election, so much of the material will not be made public until a trial. While Trump's campaign says the filing is falsehood-ridden and unconstitutional, again calling it an attempt to interfere with the November election, analysts argue that if Trump were to win the election this time, he could direct the Justice Department to drop the charges currently against him. Parmeshwar Bhava for NDTV World. For more, we're joined by Adele Nazarian. She's an American political analyst. Adele, a congressional investigation had earlier revealed stark details on Trump's alleged efforts to undo the election. But this filing cites previously unknown accounts, as we've been hearing, by some of Trump's most closest aides. What portions of that document, I'm curious, really jumped out for you? Alistair, great to be on with you again. You know, I have to say there's... Basically, this is the last attempt to try to damage Trump before the election. I think there's a lot of stuff that was in the document that was really raising eyebrows. But frankly, it's not. It was not surprising to me. You know, you can take Pence. You know, then Vice President Pence's private conversations with Trump, where he basically urged 
Trump not to try to overturn or disregard the election results, to accept them. Um, there was, you know, his disregard for, let's say, the legal failures and how he continued, despite being told by his advisors and legal teams that there was no proof to, to back his claims in court, he decided to push forth with it. But honestly, Alistair, at the end of the day, um, there's nothing in the documents, to be honest with you, that shocks me. I think that this is all to be expected. And I really, frankly, was looking for them to have more damning evidence. Right. I think the public is, you know, pretty much they they weren't blown away. I don't know if, if you if you think differently than that than I do. I was just I was just wondering, Adele, about that one incident referred to with regards to Pence when his uh, life was allegedly or apparently in danger at uh, Capitol Hill and aides told Trump about it and uh, Trump replied, you know, so what? That's very cold. I have to tell you, in general, having that kind of reaction to anyone's life, you know, being endangered like that, it's it's a very, it's an inappropriate response. Um, then again, like his own life, they attempted to take it three times and they've so far failed at it. I guess it was more so his way of shrugging it off as in, so what? Not I'm not trying to condone it in any way, shape or form, but he's probably saying, look, they tried to kill me a million times, probably more than that. Okay, there was one attempt on his life. That's just another Trumpism. You know what I mean? Another Trump being Trump, tr downplaying something because he feels that there's much more threats that he's facing and he thinks that other people should sort of man up. It's just a personality. Um, I guess you can call it a, a personality a specification right. that is unique to him. Adele, uh, remind us once again, in simple terms, about what the Supreme Court had to say about broad immunity for presidents. You know, that's something, I believe that there was something stated in, in, the, in the ruling that immunity would not be granted um, if there was election interference, if I'm not mistaken. And so it depends on how the the case of election interference is really interpreted. But I guess that's the beauty of it also, right? Um, it depends on how this is all being di you know, dissected. Um, there's some camps that do believe that the Supreme Court's definition does right. directly apply to Trump and some that they are hell bent on the fact that actually he's able to evade it because he didn't actually directly interfere with the process. It's open for interpretation. So there's this whole thing from the Supreme Court about whether he acted in his presidential capacity or as a candidate. So a distinction made there between the two. Now, how is Jack Smith really going to prove this, whether these decisions or all these moves made by Trump that day and leading up to it were really not as president of the United States, but in that personal capacity or as a political candidate? That's a really tough one. You know, the thing is, Trump didn't directly tell everyone to go and invade the Capitol. Um, if we look at the evidence, I mean, this is just being very, very objective and looking at it, not from how it was reported in the media, not from, you know, a personal emotional stance, but seeing that there was evidence that showed that actual security guards on Capitol Hill, Capitol Hill guards opened the gates, the fencing and allowed the protesters in, right? Um, that's really very damning in and of itself. Um, what he said, we all know what Trump's rhetoric is. It has been very explosive. Um, frankly, I think that if maybe he had toned it down uh, quite a bit, he may have seen a success in the 2020 election. That being said, um, was his rhetoric really a direct call to incite an insurgence and a you know resurrection, so does insurrection uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, that's again something that you'll hear diverting, diver, diverging views from, depending on what camp you're speaking to. But whether mm -hmm. or not he acted in the capacity of a civilian um, or as a, a sitting president, um, I have to say it would depend on. Um, you know, I think once someone has served as president, they always keep that title. They always right. are seen as. You know, having the, the but I want to add to that, Alistair, if I may, um, it's interesting that any any sitting president, once they've okay. left their post, um, they're able to still have the Secret Service immunity. And I believe there was a bill I sure. haven't followed up on to see if it went through. There was a bill that Congress has introduced Democrats to actually strip presidents 
of having that kind of Secret Service access post-presidency. Adele, thank you very much. Running out of time here. Hope to speak to you again here on NDTV's U.S. Election Watch. A look at some other news now in excerpts from her upcoming memoir, former First Lady Melania Trump reveals her support for abortion rights, stating they should be free from any intervention or pressure from government. She argues restricting a woman's right to choose is akin to denying her control over her own body, a belief she has held throughout her adult life. Melania Trump posted a video on social media platform X to promote her memoir. Let's take a look at what the former First Lady had to say. Individual freedom is a fundamental principle that I safeguard. Without a doubt, there is no room for compromise when it comes to this essential right that all women possess from birth, individual freedom. What does my body, my choice really mean? We're joined by Joshua Wilson. He is a professor of political science at the University of Denver. Thanks, Joshua, for joining us here this morning. Joshua, according to The Guardian that got a copy of the book, it says that Melania Trump says her beliefs about abortion rights spring from a core set of principles at the heart of which sits personal freedom on which there is no room for negotiation. Some very strong words from Trump's wife there. How did you react to some of that language, at least the excerpts that have come through? No, it's, uh, well, first, thanks for having me on. Uh, second, it, it's pretty remarkable to have this coming from Trump's wife, you know, right before the election, because what we just heard is she's echoing or embracing and deploying the language that we see uh, being used by the Democratic Party and by those who, of course, support uh, abortion rights. And so this is in direct contrast to what we hear from uh, candidate Trump and what we hear from the overwhelming majority of the Republican Party. Yeah, that's really What I was thinking about as well now, it's extremely rare for Melania Trump to even express her political views in public on really anything. Now, what does the release of this book really tell us in that case, trying to make sense of it just like you are? On one hand, she seems to be out of step with the Republican Party and what the Republican Party wants on abortion rights. Is this some way strategic, maybe, to appeal to women voters that Trump is really trying to win over, perhaps? Yeah, so of course, I have no particular insight into the the Trump campaign here, and I I find the the timing of this all pretty remarkable. But if you want to give some uh, kind of coherence to it all, the way to think about this is that the Republican Party has, ever since uh, Roe versus Wade was overturned with the Dobbs decision, the Republican Party has had a really tough time figuring out how it wants to talk about abortion. They recognize that the overturning of Roe is deeply unpopular with the majority of the United States, but they also recognize that it is deeply important to uh, certain core constituencies of theirs. And so they can't figure out how to, to navigate between those two poles. But if we think about what we just heard uh, from Melania Trump, Um, what we heard from J.D. Vance in the vice presidential debate. uh, And at the same time period, we also get Trump coming out and saying that he would veto a national ban on abortion. I think what we're we're starting to see here is an attempt, again, to insert some, uh, some nuance or rather a new way of talking about abortion. Um, So if we go back to, again, J.D. Vance in the vice presidential debate, he kept saying that the Republican Party has lost the the trust of the U.S. public and that it needs to regain uh, that trust. And so Mm -hmm. you can try to filter this through that lens and showing that, all right, you know, Trump might have uh, this political stance, but Melania right next to him has this opposing one. And maybe that's a way to try to appeal to, as you said, uh, women voters who are really turned off by um, the Dobbs decision. All right, very quickly before I let you go, Joshua, just about 30 or 40 seconds. How much of a role does a first lady, and in this case, potential first gentleman, have to play in the lead up to the elections? 
A, a pretty minor role, right? Um, you know, all the attention really is on the candidate. Uh, and then you could even say, you know, there's a big drop between the, the primary candidate and the vice president. And so looking at spouses is definitely a step removed. But on the other side, we're talking about this now. Other media outlets are talking about this now. And so this keeps the abortion issue front and center right as we're moving up to the election. Joshua Wilson there, political science professor from the University of Denver. Thank you very much indeed for your time this morning here on NDTV's U.S. Election Watch. Now, billionaire Elon Musk's financial support for right-wing causes may have started much earlier than what he may have let on. That's according to several source-based reports. Musk reportedly secretly funded a conservative political group even before endorsing former President Donald Trump's re-election bid in July. The donations make him one of the biggest donors to conservative causes. Let's not forget his large social media followers following as well, making him one of the most influential figures in U.S. politics. Vishal Vivek brings us this report. Billionaire entrepreneur Elon Musk endorsed former U.S. President Donald Trump's bid for re-election in July, marking a reversal after having spoken out against the 78-year-old. Ever since then, Musk has been on a spree on a social media platform X, doing everything he can to show his support for Trump and the Republican Party. However, Trump's support for the conservative side doesn't seem to be that new. Reports suggest that the Tesla founder secretly funded a conservative political group in recent years, showing his support for the right-wing cause. Musk's contribution to the conservative organization Building America's Future had started by 2022, the reports say. The organization vehemently criticizes both Kamala Harris and Joe Biden on issues such as immigration. According to reports, the donations amounted to millions of dollars, and it's unclear whether Musk still funds the organization. Revenues at the nonprofit organization climbed from about 11 million in 2021 to about 53 million in 2022. Musk, who was largely apolitical a few years ago, has moved rightward in recent years and has been quite swift. Whether the billionaire's moral and financial support benefited Trump or not will be clear in a few weeks' time. With Vishal Vivek, Samia Afsir for NDTV World. With the U.S. presidential elections just around the corner, opinion polls show Republican candidate Donald Trump and Democratic candidate Kamala Harris in a tight race. Both campaigns are concentrating on key swing states, which, which have historically played a significant role in election outcomes. Pennsylvania is now one of the big ones that could determine which way People could vote, and of course, that determining who sits in uh, the Oval Office. We're joined by Daniel Mallinson. He is Professor of Public Policy at Pennsylvania State University. Thanks, Daniel, for joining us here today on U.S. Election Watch. Daniel, Pennsylvania is one of the seven of those toss-up states in this year's election. As we know, in the U.S. elections, it's all about that electoral college vote. And amongst the seven swing states, none has more of those electoral votes than Pennsylvania. So that's really, really important. Give us a sense of how the state has voted in the past, flipping from between red and blue. Sure, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so Pennsylvania, as was noted on the Chiron there, uh, voted for Democratic candidates for president um, for about two decades. And then that flipped in 2016 when, when uh, former President Trump won the state and won the White House. It flipped back to President Biden in 2020, and now it's up for grabs again. In both of those last two races, the state was won by those candidates um, by only a few tens of thousands of votes. So it's about a half a percentage point win for Trump in 2016 and a one percentage point win for Biden in 2020. So it's been very close. All right. Now, a poll this week by a bipartisan group found that Harris's lead over Trump is 49 percent to Trump's 47 percent. Three percent of voters are still undecided. Now, with less than a month from Election Day, what is it that's keeping these undecided voters from knowing for sure, yes, I'm going to vote for Harris or yes, I'm going to vote for Trump? 
Yeah, it's a good question. So it's there's actually some um, there's some interesting breakdown within those undecided voters. There's a very slim number of truly undecided voters, and they're they're very kind of diverse group. Like understanding exactly what they're what's holding them back um, is is challenging, right? It's something that there's been a lot of interviews in the media here with undecided voters, and they all sort of have different issues that. Um, that they're concerned about or going back and forth between the candidates on. But there's actually also some of those undecided voters are partisans. So they're, they, are, they have voted in the past, either Republican or Democrat. And if you look within Democrats, um, there's very little undecidedness left, right? And you see Harris at 49%. There's actually still um, a bit of undecidedness among leading right. Republicans. So those Republicans that don't love Trump, um, but are, if, if the past is, um, is what we would expect in this case, they will probably end up voting for him in the end. So the, sure. the, the margin, again, is going to be much closer than that, that 3%. Daniel, like in other swing states like Pennsylvania and Michigan, Indian Americans have really been growing in numbers. Now, Indians are the largest Asian American ethnic group in Pennsylvania. What are some of the concerns for the this Indian American community in Pennsylvania going into the election? Yeah, so I mean, the concerns are very similar to, to other voters. Uh, the economy is a top concern. Um, the uh, inflation in the past few uh, few years has really been affecting Americans um, quite a bit, and you see that in this race. Um, in in terms of the, the that is the top concern that that voters have reported. Um, <clears throat> Indian Americans, though, have also uh, in polling shown to be very concerned about the war in uh, in Gaza and are very critical of um, of the Biden administration and, and Israel and the conduct of the war in Gaza. Um, so that is something that uh, it has been shown to be of particular interest um, within that community. Um, but it is a very diverse community. There's there's about 50 percent are um, Democrats, about 25 percent are Republicans, and then 25 percent are independent, at least here in Pennsylvania. Um, and so right. you have folks that are business owners and are more attracted to Trump. You have others that are a little more um maybe a little mm -hmm. more socially liberal and attracted to Harris. Sure. Thanks very much indeed. That was uh, Daniel Mallinson with the with, with uh, Pennsylvania State University joining us here on NDTV US Election Watch. Now, in other news, Trump's Trump talking about Haitian immigrants again. Now, the former President Donald Trump has vowed to deport migrants with legal status. In an interview with News Nation, Trump said he planned to strip the legal status of people from Haiti living in Springfield, Ohio, who have been granted temporary protected status. Trump in recent weeks has spread false conspiracy theories, as you might know, about Haitian migrants eating pets in Springfield, Ohio. Now, both the Trump and Harris campaigns are targeting key demographic groups to gain an edge in their race to the Oval Office with a focus on Asian American voters. This group is recognized as one of the fastest growing segments of the eligible electoral voters amongst racial and ethnic demographics, some of which we just heard there in our conversation. Now, NDTV's Vishal Vivek brings us more on this part of the story. With voter registration deadlines quickly approaching in many U.S. states and early voting already underway in several others, the Donald Trump and Kamala Harris campaigns are targeting the nation's various demographic groups in hopes of finding an advantage in this nail-biting race to the Oval House. Both sides particularly have their eyes on the Asian American voters as they see an opportunity among the fastest growing segment of the eligible electorate of any major racial and ethnic group. Asian Americans have a rising population in Georgia, North Carolina and other battlegrounds. 
An AAPI data poll from last week found that 66% of Asian American voters plan to support Harris and 28% intend to back Trump, expanding Biden's 15-point lead by 23 percentage points since the spring. According to the Pew Research Center, about 15 million Asian Americans are projected to be eligible to vote in 2024, which is up 15 percent from the 2020 election. And when Joe Biden won Georgia by just 11,780 votes that year, it showed how valuable each vote is. This highlights the significance of those 15 million potential Asian American voters. And within that bracket is another key group of Indian Americans, with over 2.1 million eligible to vote this time. It is the largest and most politically active group among Asian Americans. A 2024 survey found that 55% of Indian Americans identify as Democrats and 25% as Republicans. However, the number of Indian Americans identifying as Republicans has been increasing since 2020, something Harris will need to work on. With Vishal Vivek, Bureau Report, NDTV World. That's it for U.S. Election Watch. I'm Alistair D'Souza in Washington, D.C.